Welcome everyone. My name is Lynn Reader, founder of Mindful Futures Network. Uh, as you know, we've been collecting information on the application of mindfulness, empathy and compassion in, uh, at a uh, systems level. Uh, Paul Atkins has actually uh, put, you know, submitted uh, two projects that he's working on and he might mention some of those today. Um, but these webinars are providing people with the opportunity um, just to get a little bit more depth uh, around what's happening. So I'm very appreciative of uh, Paul and, and Nikki giving their time today. So I'll hand over to Nikki, who's going to do the Q&A. Uh, we're going to try and keep these uh, webinars tight because we know that people, uh, people's time is important. And uh, um, but uh, so I'd like to hand over now to Nikki. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Paul. As Lynn said, we'll hop straight into it. So, Paul, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions, if that's okay. So, oh. in the Mindful Futures, in the Mindful Futures Network, we're interested in mindfulness, empathy, and compassion, not just as individual practices, but how they play out in groups and in organisations. So, it means this concept of mindful cooperation is particularly relevant. Can you shed some light on what mindful cooperation means? What does it mean to you? Well, thanks, Nikki. Um, I thought, thinking about the answer to that question, I wanted to divide it up into three or four levels because I think that, um, that makes it, it makes it a bit easier to understand. We're probably all familiar with the idea of mindfulness as non-judgmental awareness of the present moment for individuals. I like to think of mindfulness in, um, in terms of a, a concept we call psychological flexibility, which on this slide here capacity to move in the direction of our values, even in the presence of difficult emotions. The reason I like to think about mindfulness in those terms is because um, I think mindfulness in general is sometimes pitched in our society as being about um, getting rid of stress. Uh, and in all the work that I do, I like to frame it with people more in terms of mindfulness in the service of doing the things that matter in your life. So at the individual, the personal level, um, we tend to work with um, people's individual values uh, and also cultivating that capacity to have a kind of open, non-judgmental awareness. At the next level, there's the interpersonal, the sort of di dyadic level, if you like, of a relationship. And there, what um, we're mostly interested in is, is open, non-judgmental dialogue and listening capabilities. And that's how mindfulness kind of plays out at, at that level. Um, it also sort of tends to show up in things like not being too invested in our egos or trying to defend a particular position or being right or, <clears throat> or anything like that. Um, okay. Then there's a couple of sort of final levels, which is like the small group level and then groups of groups. Really what it is, is, is again, this kind of openness and inclusiveness in decision making, for example. Um, uh, a, an approach that's based around abundance rather than scarcity. Um, and the way that we're operationalizing that is by looking to the literature on uh, communities organise in the commons. So I've got on that slide just there. Um, the way we understand the commons is some kind of resource or purposeful group, um, a, a local community and a set of social practices and agreements that move us in that direction. And again, they can be infused with mindfulness or not. Uh, they work a lot better when they're infused with mindfulness. So I think it, um, mindfulness sort of understood at those, at those four different levels. Okay. And so if you are working in a group or watching a group working, how would you recognise that this sort of mindful cooperation? You've, you've mentioned things like dialogue and listening and open judgmental awareness. So I'm just, um, if you could tell us a little more about the sorts of things that you would be looking to to recognise it and the sort of benefits that you'd see as a result of it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, to a certain extent, recognising it is like you recognise it in any group or in any individual, a, a willingness to listen, a willingness to be present, um, a tendency not to be too judgmental or defensive and all of those things. Those are the kinds of things we're looking for in the group. Um, a 
I think mindfulness helps us to cultivate a kind of trust in ourselves and a trust in others as well. Um, and so, you know, that's we're sort of looking for that trusting environment. Um, beyond that, uh, I think that it's important that we seek to bring in some of these other processes. I might just show you. I've got these slides. I wasn't planning on going through them all, but. Um, Eleanor Ostrom's um, work on the commons where she looked at um, how groups, effective groups manage res uh, common pool resources internationally, she came up with these eight principles, um, shared identity and purpose, equity, inclusiveness, non-hierarchical monitoring of agreed behaviours, um, an approach for mon uh, pro uh, responding to transgressions, an approach for conflict resolution. So I'm really looking for mindfulness to pervade all of those. Um, and we're trying to, uh, when we do, we start, we start with that individual level and then we try and sort of, uh, we start with the individual level, then we go to dialogue training and then we go to these principles to try and cultivate mindfulness in, in application in all of those areas. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, and so I guess I was just going to expand on, ask you to expand on that then, because you're involved in developing the pro-social initiative, which is about helping groups work effectively together and do exactly that. So I'm just wondering if you can tell us about the sorts of tools and approaches that you use to help foster that kind of mindful cooperation in groups. Sure. One of the tools that we use is a tool that's drawn from acceptance and commitment training. Um, and it's a, um, an approach we call the acceptance and commitment training matrix. I might just briefly demonstrate that. Just give you a little bit of context to ProSocial. ProSocial is an um, international initiative. It uh, involves an evolutionary biologist and some psychologists and a filmmaker. Uh, there's a bunch of us working on this initiative. And essentially it's about a mindfulness-based approach to building collaboration in all small groups. Um, based upon this tool I'm about to show you and also Ostrom's principles. So the ACT matrix is based around this very simple idea that we're, uh, we can be mindful of two core discriminations at any given moment. The one, first one is are we moving towards what's appetitive to us or away from what's aversive to us? So you know you might be moving towards something you really care about, maybe it's connection in a group or it might be moving away from something like, um, oh, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm worried other people might disapprove of me. If you're, a, if you're an animal, animals do towards and away, um, do very simply, but um, they don't have uh, you know, a mind that gets really busy and so forth. So they're just responding sort of automatically, if you like. Once you add in language, then we need another discrimination. We need a discrimination between the internal world, our thinking and feeling, and the outer world, what's actually going on in the outer world. And so what we're doing in groups is we're helping people to start to categorise and discriminate their experience. Is this a towards move or am I moving away from something that's, you know, am I, am I under the control of something that's aversive or am I under the control of something that's appetitive? Am I moving towards what matters to me? Um, and then also this discrimination between is this something that's actually going on in the world or is it something that uh, really about my internal experience. So in practice we would teach people in a group, um, say for example we might do a short exercise, we might just sit for a moment noticing sensations and uh, what I'm hearing and seeing and smelling and also noticing thoughts and feelings and just making the distinction thinking, thinking, thinking or sensing, sensing, sensing. So we might just give them a bit of that discrimination training. And then you know, I'll just show you how this might work out in a group. So we might start down in the bottom right there. Um, I might say who or what's important to you about this group. And uh, this is my own example of my research group at um, the Institute for Positive Psychology and Education. Some of the things that matter to me are my colleagues and passion-filled research and fun and friendship. Um, 
Then we go over to the more away side. You know, what sorts of inner stuff shows up and gets in the way of me moving in the direction of all of those things I care about? One of the big ones for me personally is um, this growing belief that I'm actually hinting as I get older. <laughs> I seem to be forgetting things and I'm not smart enough. So anyway, when that happens and, and, and those sorts of inner experiences show up, I actually do disconnect from my colleagues. I start to um, sort of think, oh, I start to do these sorts of things, which is the next step. Um, I might um, not speak to them when I, dis when I, I, do, I disagree with them because I'm concerned about what they might think or I might um, you know, work on projects by myself that are less meaningful and not connected to others. And what I'd like to be doing to move towards what's who, who, who and what's important to me is more of this stuff, the you know, showing up, uh, engaging with my colleagues and so forth. So you can see that what this matrix tool does is kind of creates a map of what we value, what's going on in our minds, how we abstract what we care about, um, and the goals that we would you know, like to pursue, the activities we'd like to pursue to move in the direction of what we care about. But it also allows us to map the inner stuff that tends to show up and the behaviours that flow from that um, when we get that inner stuff showing up. And the key part where it becomes mindfulness and not just goal setting is we spend a lot of time training up this capacity to sit in the middle and discriminate what's going on so that uh, we can move in the direction of what matters to us, this top right um, corner, even in the presence of all this difficult stuff showing up in the middle. Um, and I'll just say one last thing about um, about the individual matrix. So in our pro-social process, we usually start with the individual matrix because what we want to do is create an environment of trust and vulnerability in the room and, and willingness to share. That spiral there was just to indicate that we can sometimes get locked into a kind of defensive thing where when difficult stuff shows up, we avoid the difficulties. So that means we disengage from our colleagues and so more difficult stuff shows up and so forth. The last thing that I just wanted to show you was we can also use, and this is the key bit, we can also use the matrix at the group level. So instead of doing all of that as an individual, we can do it as what do we care about and what stuff shows up for us that gets in the way and what do we do as a group collectively um, and what do we want to do to move towards. And then you can sort of establish this concept of collective mindfulness or um, you know, mindful cooperation what does it look like for us to actually notice people getting hooked by stuff and acting in ways we'd rather not have them act um, and still noticing that with a degree of kindness and curiosity, but being able to move towards what we care about. There's one piece that just crossed my mind and then I'll, I'll shut up <laughs> and open it up for questions, but a really key part of mindfulness I know when I present this it sounds like it's all lovey-dovey and you know compassion and kindness and so forth. And it is, because that I think mindfulness is very much about self-compassion and compassion towards others. But there's also an edge to mindfulness which is about courage and the courage to confront behaviours that we're not happy with um, uh, rather than avoid them. And uh, you know, so this thing about psychological flexibility to move towards what matters to us even when we're hooked is um, also enables that kind of, um, I don't want to say hard edge, but the courageous side, if you like, of being in a group. I, I suppose one question I had, Paul, was around that issue of, of courage. It seems that, um, uh, you know, I was even reading a, an article by uh, John Kabat-Zinn just yesterday just saying that, um, you know, we, we know that we have uh, this intelligent mind sitting over these older um, emotion uh, emotion regulation systems, so threat-based, drive-based, um, and it's actually driving us crazy. So it's, it's really not an optional thing. We, we really need to be doing this in a very detailed way. So I was wanting you to speak a little bit more about that um, courage, how we start uh, I know that Paul Gilbert, for example, talks about 
you know, the, the courage um, around compassion is receiving compassion from other people, you know, giving it to ourselves and giving it to other people. So those three sort of ways of, um, of those barriers. So I just wonder in pro-social, do they go into those barriers a bit? So I, I, well, one thing I want to say is for me, courage is about, um, it's not about lack of fear, right? It's about moving in the direction of what matters for ourselves or the group, even in the presence of fear. Um, and so it's you know almost synonymous with this notion that in the ACT literature, in the acceptance and commitment therapy literature and training literature, we call psychological flexibility. Moving in the direction of what matters, even when it's difficult internally. Now I think um, you mentioned we've got these sort of uh, multiple, we've got a more cognitive system and we've got some more um, sort of primitive operant learning systems, if you like, that are in the brain. Um, one of the reasons why I think meditation is useful, I tend to think of meditation as multiple exemplar training in noticing the difficulties that show up and staying present to that. So it's actually training up that more primitive lizard brain, if you like, to feel fear, to feel discomfort and stay with it. In the, and sort of go towards it or even move through it, if you like. And that is the very essence of courage. I think you can also get at courage sort of top down from a more self-regulatory point of view in a more cognitive way as well by being really clear about what matters to you. And that um, in the presence of very clear purpose and intention, we're more likely to um, be willing to put up with the discomfort of, say, for example, I mean, think about courage in a group. It's usually about something like fronting up to conflict. <laughs> That's a big one for most groups. Or maybe handling underperformance or, or something like that, which is really a form of conflict in one way or another. Um, so in the presence of, say, for example, conflict, what I'm saying is there's, you can recruit either of those brain systems. You can, through meditation training, you can have repeated experience of just being in the presence of aversiveness but still uh, remaining open to that and through um, work on values and goals and shared identity and purpose you can uh, create a context that very strongly pulls for people to be courageous um, even in the presence of difficulty. Does that answer that question? Yeah, I, I think too that there's an um it seems that there's a lot of anger in the world and a lot of the debates that we're having at a political level at the moment, you know, are, are sort of joining in that sort of us against them. And um, uh, so that sense of I, I know how the world works and I want it to stay that way for me to feel safe. So mm. I'm wondering the work that you're doing in pro-social um, and with organisations, you know, are you getting, um, I mean, it's it's fine for people who, you know, for example, who are in the network, they're, they're already keen and interested in this. You know, how are you working with people, say, in organisations that have that high level of resistance? Well, again, this is where our model starts with shared purpose. Um, we really, um, I tried for many years to sort of run mindfulness-based stress reduction courses in organisations and I didn't get the buy-in as a stress reduction tool that I now get when I go in and I say, what do you care about? And what's, what's tricky? You know, imagine this, this, this image that's right on the screen now. What do you care about? And what gets in your way of moving towards that? And then we're instantly in something that they care about. Um, so the whole conversation is framed in terms of in terms of something that the group cares about and then using mindfulness to enable that. Um, I suppose you mentioned, I think you mentioned something about um, sort of getting stuck in beliefs and prejudice and um, our kind of image of what the world is about. I mean, this is one of the reasons why it's really key to do that, that vertical discrimination because you know, a lot of the anger and reactivity that we see in organisations and in groups is really about people's image of the world, their story of the world, and their story of who, who I am and how I have to be right and so forth. And so to the extent that we can get people to 
kind of make room for that inner voice and that inner framing of the world, but still contact what's actually happening here. Like, what did Lynn actually just say just then, rather than what I think she said? Um, and that's that vertical discrimination. Um, and into the actual contingencies of experience, then we can start to move towards what we actually care about. No, it's, it's, I think it's challenge the challenge of, uh, of, of our world today. You know, I mean, look at the way that you know Trump, for example, engages with the world. It's all about division. It's all about um, you know these kind of arbitrary categories of right and wrong and so forth, and and. Um, very little contact with what we actually care about collectively. Mm, yes, having that global conversation. I should have mentioned probably my background. I don't know if that's being described, but I'm, I am an organisational psych working at the Institute for Positive Psychology and Education in Strathfield. I've just got a question. It's Margaret asking, would it be right to say that an assumption of uh, development or self-awareness critical to this? It helps a lot if you've got a group that's, you know, uh, developed enough to be able to take the perspective of others, for example, or they've got a sort of self a perspective taking ability on their own internal experience. If, if that's already there, then you can slot into it really quickly. Um, but we've used pro-social in a variety of contexts. I'm currently using it in a um, uh, well, literally, a, a you know a big commercial organisation that's in a very sort of concrete um, industry, and they're very focused on you know just getting things done. That most of them haven't heard of mindfulness before, and so we're starting with this kind of really basic approach to mindfulness in the service of what matters to you, and that that's where it's really important, uh, Margaret, is to um, yeah to not kind of frame up mindfulness as this good thing that you should have, that you have to develop, because you just get pushback, in my experience, when you try and do it that way. But if you frame it up as, what do you care about and what's getting in your way, and how might mindfulness help with that, then people are usually likely to put in the, the work. It also helps a fair bit that mindfulness now is just absolutely mainstream, and so I get a lot less resistance now than I did you know, when I started doing this work 12 years ago. Thanks, Paul. Um, and uh, Deb has asked a question. In a fairly cutthroat, cynical, fake news environment, how do you manage to convince, especially commercial organisations, to take on something touchy-feely? You're, you're actually just addressing that, Paul. We do have evidence. We've got some great evidence um, from uh, one place. Well, two, two very different things that I might want to mention. One was in an Australian government um, public sector agency where we showed really big shifts in a positive direction in staff morale and attitudes to management. Uh, at the same time, this was 2014 to 2015, at the same time that the rest of the Australian public service was decreasing dramatically in all of those things. So, um, you know, usually I'm talking to managers and basically I'm giving them something that they want, which is better leadership, more cooperation, more collaboration, better communication and so forth. So framing it up in those terms. Um, but I would just briefly mention that we've also used it in contexts as diverse as in Sierra Leone, working with the Ebola crisis um, to change community groups. Now that's a very undereducated group, not to say that they're not self-aware, I um, can't really speak to that, but they, they're not highly educated by any means. And in that group, we were able to, uh, I say we, it wasn't me personally, it was my co some of my colleagues, were able to um, shift behaviour um, so that they were much less likely to spread the infection. Um, so I think this is all about human values. It's not necessarily about really high educational um, levels. Your point about cynicism is a really, really key one. And I used to yield to that until I realised that was my own avoidance, that I didn't want to be disapproved of. Now I'm just, um, I quite often start out my slides with something like, creating the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. Like I'm unashamedly idealistic in as many contexts as I can be, because I've noticed that um, 
you know, there are people out there that want to be idealistic in this in this day and age, in this day and age of cynicism. Yeah. It's not always appropriate. There are certain circumstances where I just get laughed out of the room or people would disconnect. And in those circumstances, I go to, you know, this will help you do things you care about. But I, I think it's really worthwhile for the people listening to look at how we censor ourselves, how we censor our own bearing because we've been told over and over again that the world is about money and efficiency and all of these things. It's just not. It's just not. And we're starting to realise that. Yeah, well, Margaret actually has put in another comment saying, in the corporate world, my experience is that workplace expectations significantly colour people's views or at least what they will expose of themselves. So that's exactly what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah, there is, there's certain framings. And I mean, one of the things here is the distinction between the personal and the professional. You know, we have this idea that at work we're supposed to be this kind of machine that's, um, you know, efficiently producing outputs or something. And, and there's this big gap between um, personal and professional. So I have people saying to me, you know, I don't do emotions at work which is indicative of that gap, but it's actually also indicative of just a huge denial and avoidance. And this is where mindfulness is so key, is to train people up in contacting that. You know? So sometimes I've done work, for example, showing the importance of using emotion effectively in decision making, because emotions were evolved to help us make decisions. Um, you can connect, one, you can connect to the literature around that, but you can just show it experientially. You know, last time you made an important decision, was there any emotion present? What was it telling you? How was it pushing you? Um, and then learning to kind of unhook from that. So you can, you can come up with language that appeals to sort of alpha males, like situational awareness and metacognitive awareness and stuff like this, and you could just have to frame it up. But again, the basic principle is, what do you really care about? And how is this, you know, evolved psychological system which generally is self-protective and helpful, but how might it be tripping you up in moving towards what you care about? Yeah, that's right. In fact, there's, there are you know, neuroscience studies showing that um, people who have the parts of the brain damaged, you know, that experience emotions, simply cannot make decisions because there's nothing there for them to be able to choose between. Um, yeah. yeah, that's right. They just lack that part of the... You know, they lack the capacity to value and care. Actually, it's a very good example, and I'd probably draw on it, um, literature like that. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, um, we're at the uh, at the end of a half hour. I want to very much thank Paul and Nikki for their time uh, today. We will be continuing to have these webinars um, probably early next year now, and. Um, one of the things that we're really wanting to do in the Mindful Futures Network is um, be gathering these stories of how mindfulness is being applied um, in workplaces, in systems. Uh, so again, I ask um, for, for people if they're doing those or if they know of people who are doing them, can they please send them in um, so that we can be really collecting this information and see the difference that it's making. So thank you everyone um, and uh, uh, look forward to catching up again. Thanks everyone. Thanks Paul. Thanks Nikki. Thank you. Thank you. If, if people want to learn more about ProSocial, there's some details on the screen.